Personality is defined as the consistent and enduring pattern of behavior, thought, and emotion that a person shows throughout their life. To put it in even simpler terms, personality is how someone acts, thinks, and feels when interacting with the world. While everyone's personality is different, some people have personality traits that are inflexible and maladaptive, resulting in distress, disability, and dysfunction. These people are said to have personality disorders. Before we can talk about personality disorders, though, we must first understand what is meant by normal personality. Humans have come up with various methods to describe personality, even going back thousands of years. Most of these schemes attempt to divide people into distinct personality types. For example, you may have heard of the four humors, including sanguine, for social, extroverted, and fun-loving people, choleric, for hot-tempered, decisive, and strong-willed people, melancholic, for artistic, introverted, and private people, and phlegmatic, for calm, easygoing, and conflict-avoidant people. More recently, the well-known Myers-Briggs type indicator similarly attempts to group people into 16 distinct categories. However, while these personality types seem to make sense on first glance, they actually do a pretty poor job of accurately describing someone's behavior, thoughts, and emotions in the long run. This is because personalities are not distinct buckets that people either fit into or not. Instead, personalities exist on a spectrum, with a few people fitting neatly into categorical buckets, but most people falling somewhere in the middle. For this reason, personality is best described using dimensional traits rather than categorical types. There are different ways of describing personality traits, but the most widely accepted is known as the Big Five Personality Traits, also called the Five-Factor Model. These traits have been shown in multiple studies to be both reliable, meaning that they're stable over time and stay consistent from childhood through adulthood and even into old age, as well as valid, meaning that someone's self-assessment of these traits generally agrees with reports from outside observers like family or friends. These traits have also been observed in different cultures around the world, suggesting that they are universal patterns which are inherent to humanity and not just reflective of any one particular society. You can remember these traits using the acronym OCEAN. First, O is for openness to experience. People who score highly on openness to experience are generally imaginative and tend to be interested in novelty, whether that involves the arts, travel, or innovative ideas. Conversely, those who score low on this trait tend to be more conventional in their outlook, valuing perseverance and practicality over new experiences. Next, C is for conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is the tendency to act according to both personal and societal expectations, including following rules, keeping things orderly, and working to meet goals. People who are highly conscientious tend towards planned behaviors, which can lead to great accomplishments, but they can also be overly rigid when it comes to following rules and schedules. In contrast, people who are less conscientious are more spontaneous and free-spirited, though they may also risk being impulsive or unreliable as a result. Next, E is for extroversion. Extroversion is a tendency to focus on one's external environment, with a particular fondness for wanting to be around other people. The opposite of extroversion is introversion, or the tendency to focus instead on one's inner mental and emotional state. The mark of an extrovert is that they gain mental energy from interacting with others, while introverts tend to have their mental energy depleted by being around others and will often need time alone in order to recharge. Next, A is for agreeableness. Agreeableness refers to the priority that one places on getting along with other people. Those with high agreeableness are seen as helpful, kind, and trustworthy, and tend to put others' interests ahead of their own, though they may be prone to peer pressure and groupthink as a result. In contrast, people who score low on agreeableness are less interested in social harmony, and will put forth less time and effort into helping others, and may even view others' motives with skepticism. Finally, N is for neuroticism. Neuroticism refers to the tendency to experience negative emotions such as anger, sadness, and anxiety over positive emotions such as happiness, joy, and contentment. People with high neuroticism tend to spend more time focusing on negative things in the present, thinking of mistakes from the past, and worrying about bad outcomes in the future. On the other hand, people who score low on neuroticism are less emotionally reactive, and tend to become upset less often. It's important to note that low neuroticism does not mean that these people are in a perpetually positive mood. Rather, they tend to have freedom from persistent negative moods. So how do we get from the personality traits in the OCEAN acronym to the specific personality disorders listed in the DSM? It's initially tempting to think that it's the mere presence or absence of specific traits that's problematic. 
For example, you might think that agreeableness is good and neuroticism is bad, so a personality disorder would emerge when someone has too little agreeableness or too much neuroticism. However, this isn't necessarily the case. None of the ocean traits are inherently good or bad, and even seemingly positive attributes like agreeableness or conscientiousness can become problematic, as we'll see shortly. Instead, personality disorders emerge when specific personality traits become inflexible, disabling, and extreme. Handily, these words form the acronym TIDE, which should be easy to link to the word OCEAN. Let's look at each of these in more detail. First, I is for inflexible. For most people, personality traits are stable, with someone experiencing similar behaviors, thoughts, and emotions across their entire life. However, these traits are also flexible and can adapt to different situations. For example, someone who is extroverted may be more likely to spend their Friday nights out partying than someone who is introverted, but that doesn't mean that the extrovert never spends time alone or that the introvert never goes out. In this way, personality is simultaneously both consistent and flexible. In contrast, problems can emerge when traits become rigid and unbending. For example, someone who is spontaneous and free-spirited may bring joy to their group of friends with their exciting and fast-paced lifestyle. However, they still need to be able to rein in their impulsive side in situations where this is necessary, such as being at work or giving testimony in a court case. In contrast, if this person had a maladaptively inflexible level of impulsivity, they would be spontaneous and careless in all areas of their life, which could make it difficult for them to maintain relationships or hold a job. Next, D is for disabling. The problematic nature of the traits seen in personality disorders are not only distressing to the individual, but also aggravating to the people around them, resulting in significant social and occupational dysfunction. In particular, personality disorders tend to impact one's ability to form lasting and meaningful relationships, leading many to have chaotic or destructive relationships with others in their lives, or, conversely, to shy away from seeking connection altogether. Because these problematic traits are often a core part of one's identity, patients rarely seek medical attention saying, there's something wrong with my personality. Rather, most people with personality disorders come in reporting depression, anxiety, or stress due to the effects of their personality, such as conflicts at work or a lack of close friends. Finally, the E is for extreme. We established earlier that personality traits exist on a spectrum, with most people being somewhere in the middle. In contrast, people with personality disorders tend to live at the extremes, with either incredibly high or incredibly low scores on measures of openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. The extreme nature of these traits makes it hard for them to operate in situations that call for the other end of the spectrum, leading directly to the inflexibility and disability that we've talked about already. So that's the theoretical basis of how personality disorders emerge. Unfortunately, making the jump from that framework to the specific personality disorders listed in the DSM is not a straightforward process. This is because the current diagnostic scheme for personality disorders in the DSM is, to be perfectly honest, kind of a mess. The DSM does not base its personality disorder diagnoses on any specific personality framework like the OCEAN model. Instead, the personality disorders listed in the DSM are based on old and frankly outdated psychological theories. Like a broken clock that happens to be right a couple of times a day, at times the DSM's diagnostic scheme works, with some personality disorders mapping neatly onto specific ocean traits. For other personality disorders, however, any relationship with the ocean traits or any other validated framework is scarce or even non-existent. Nevertheless, the DSM remains the most common way of categorizing mental pathology in the United States, so it's still important to understand how it attempts to characterize and describe personality pathology. Traditionally, the DSM categorized personality disorders into three distinct groups. Cluster A, the weird cluster of paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal personality disorders. Cluster B, the wild cluster of borderline, antisocial, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorders. And Cluster C, the worried cluster of dependent, obsessive-compulsive, and avoidant personality disorders. For the most part, these clusters are based more on superficial resemblances between the disorders than on actual shared pathological processes. The main exception to this is cluster B, as the four disorders in this cluster do appear to have a common underlying pathology. For clusters A and C, however, any similarities between the disorders are only surface level, with few shared diagnostic patterns or underlying causes to be found. So when learning about the personality disorder clusters, keep in mind that these clusters are largely based on tradition rather than science. 
Regardless of their shaky scientific foundations, you may be asked to identify disorders from each cluster, so having a mnemonic to group them can be helpful. You can remember these categories by thinking of what would happen if you were to invite people from each cluster to a party. Cluster A will want to pass on the invitation, as people with these disorders tend to shy away from social interaction. Cluster B will come to the party, but they run the risk of being banned from future parties for engaging in overly emotional, self-centered, manipulative, or even aggressive behavior. Finally, Cluster C will join as well, but the party will be DOA or dead on arrival, given their tendency to drag down the spirit of the event with their highly anxious and neurotic behavior. These 10 disorders are a highly variable group that are often more different than they are alike. Because of this variation, we'll wait until we discuss each personality disorder individually to talk about the specific signs and symptoms associated with each. For now, we will focus primarily on the core features shared by all personality disorders, including who gets them, what happens once they do, and what forms of treatment are effective. Personality disorders are common, with a relatively high base rate in the population, around 10%. In certain settings, the rate is higher still, with even conservative estimates suggesting that around a third or more of patients in psychiatry clinics meet criteria for a personality disorder. This high prevalence, combined with the stigma that often accompanies these diagnoses, makes it so that personality disorders are often underdiagnosed compared to other mental disorders like depression or bipolar disorder. The characteristic patterns of personality disorders tend to develop early in life, with most people showing signs by their teenage years, if not even earlier. Despite this fact, many clinicians are reluctant to diagnose personality disorders before the age of 18, as they want to avoid giving such a permanent and unchanging label at a time when personality is thought to still be in the process of developing. However, while personality is more fluid during development than during adulthood, many of the key patterns of personality are still noticeable even from an early age. While it's always wise to be cautious and to allow for normal variations in personality during childhood and adolescence, it does a disservice to our patients to ignore clear signs of a personality disorder when they're present, especially as some conditions respond well to earlier intervention and treatment. Personality disorders as a whole are found with roughly the same frequency in both men and women. However, the gender ratio varies from one disorder to the next, such as narcissistic personality disorder being more common in men and histrionic personality disorder being more common in women. You might expect that, as with anything related to personality, the dysfunction seen in personality disorders would be chronic and enduring, rather than transient or episodic, and to a large extent this is true. However, as we learn more about personality disorders, it's becoming clearer that they are not lifelong conditions in every case. Just as personality is not completely fluid during childhood, it is also not completely rigid as an adult. Recent evidence suggests that, while changes are slower to happen after a certain age, Personality remains malleable over the entire lifespan. For people with personality disorders, there is often a natural leveling off of severity that occurs as the patient enters middle and later adulthood, and in many cases the patient may no longer even meet criteria for the disorder, even if some of the core patterns remain present to a certain extent. This means that personality disorders are no longer a life sentence of incurable and untreatable disability, even without treatment. Speaking of which, available evidence on effective treatment of personality disorders is severely lacking, as they are some of the most understudied conditions in all of psychiatry. However, the evidence that does exist tends to suggest that personality disorders are difficult to treat. Because long-term change is hard work for both the patient and their treatment team, many clinicians prefer not to work with these patients or, if they do, to focus on specific symptoms like insomnia or anxiety that are seen as more easily treatable using conventional treatments like medications. However, the presence of a personality disorder is a major risk factor for treatment failure when trying to manage other conditions, so providers taking this approach often end up continuing a cycle of failed trials and dashed expectations. For this reason, it is best to thoughtfully but assertively address the presence of a personality disorder and work with the patient on managing it, rather than pretending that it doesn't exist. In general, psychotherapy should be the primary form of treatment, as it is significantly more effective than medications. Psychoeducation about the nature of the disorder is almost always helpful if it is done empathically in a way that does not further stigmatize the patient. Beyond that, there are a few specific forms of therapy that have been shown to be effective for individual personality disorders, such as dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT, for borderline personality disorder. We'll cover these when we talk about the individual disorders in more detail. 
So that's personality disorders in a nutshell. While some clinicians believe that they are doing patients a favor by avoiding the potentially stigmatizing diagnosis of a personality disorder, the fact of the matter is that doing so also deprives them of the benefits of diagnosis, including providing information about their prognosis, predicting their response to treatment, allowing for referrals to evidence-based forms of therapy, and relieving distress through psychoeducation. For personality disorders in particular, a diagnosis often provides a helpful unifying framework for why someone is experiencing multiple different types of symptoms at once. There's no doubt that working with personality disorders can be challenging. However, that doesn't erase the need to provide care for our most vulnerable patients, and the cases that are initially the most challenging often end up being the most rewarding as you start to see them make hard-won progress towards a better life. And that's it. Thanks for watching this video. I hope it helped you to see personality and personality disorders from a different angle than you might have previously. If you'd like to learn more about personality disorders, subscribe to my channel to be notified when the next set of videos is released. You can also check out my book Memorable Psychiatry on Amazon if you'd like to do a deeper dive. Until next time, bye for now.